Okay, good evening, welcome. My name is Joseph Gerson, and I'm really pleased to be welcoming you to this evening's Morning in Australia, exceptional and really quite timely webinar, Shifting Power Dynamics, Ukraine, Russia, and US-Chinese Relations in a Multipolar World. This webinar has been organized by the Committee for Sane US-China Policy. Uh, Co-sponsors are the Campaign for Peace, Disarmament, and Common Security, Massachusetts Peace Action, and Save Humanity and Planet Earth, SHAPE. As we begin, I also wanna thank Mariana Fernandez who is anchoring our Zoom system. Since well before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we've been working to understand the tectonic changes in global systems and the world disorder. As the US national security strategy warned, the post-Cold War period is now past and there is competition among the great and lesser powers to shape the emerging era. While the Biden administration tends to perceive the world as being divided bet between two great power blocks with the US and its allies on one side and a nefarious alliance of China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea on the other, most of the world sees a much more complex picture with multiple centers of power and complex fluid arrangements among the major players. We see this in the world's response to the war in Ukraine. The Ukraine war has brought forward forces that have been building for years crystallizing into a new multipolar world. While many in Washington believe that the entire world, minus four bad actors, support Western efforts to secure a decisive Ukrainian victory over Russia, most Global South leaders have avoided taking sides in the war and preferred an early negotiated settlement. What they see emerging is a multipolar world in which the US, the EU, China, Russia, India, and other countries exercise significant global power and influence along with regional powers like Turkey, Brazil, Indonesia, and South oh. Africa. In this new era, addressing global problems like climate change, pandemics, and major wars like that in Ukraine will require coordination and cooperation among several of these power centers, not just two. This evening, even as there, are less, even as there is less certainty about Russia's political future, with talks by three of the world's renowned analysts, we'll be exploring what the emerging multipolar order looks like, how its emergence will affect the outcome of the war in Ukraine, and how it will affect US-Chinese relations and other global stresses. These are the questions that will be addressed by our distinguished panelists. Before introducing our speakers, let me say a few words about our format and logistics. We will begin our session with two rounds of questions for our panelists. Each of them will have uh, seven minutes to respond in each round. We'll then turn to a question and answer period. If you have a question, please use the Q&A button, but, uh, button at the bottom uh, and in the center of your computer screen. I'll do my best to ask as many of your questions as possible. And let me ask that you, if you please, will be kind to this evening's moderator by only posting questions there. If you fill it up with comments, it'll be more difficult for me to see the questions and we'll slow things down. Let me then introduce our speakers uh, uh, before I put them on the spot with our questions. Uh, going in the order that they'll be speaking, uh, Joseph Camarelli of uh, La Trobe University is one of Australia's leading international relations scholars. He has pursued a wide range of research interests. These include regional and global governance, uh, the political economy of Asia Pacific, the role of religion and culture in international affairs, the politics of oil in the Middle East, uh, and security policy, including weapons of, uh, we nuclear weapons and non-proliferation. He is also one of the co-founders of SHAPE, along with Richard Falk and Chandra Musafar. Uh, Helena Cobbin is a non-resident senior fellow at the Center for International Policy. Uh, she is president of Just World Educational uh, and a writer and researcher on international relations with special interests in the Middle East and the international system. She's a member of the Committee for Sane U.S.-China Policy Steering Committee and author of seven books on current, interna current uh, international affairs, four of them focusing on the Middle East. Uh, she is a contributing, uh, she contributes a regular column on global issues to uh, Christian Science Monitor and is a leading editor of the, a contributing editor of the Boston Review. Currently, she is writing for globalities.org. Let me also confess that I've admired Helena uh, since uh, her near youth uh, when she was one of the really best uh, journalists uh, and courageous ones uh, describing what was developing in the Lebanese Civil War. 
uh, and I just have really the greatest respect for what she did then. Michael Clare has been a peace educator and researcher since the Vietnam War era and served uh, as the five college professor of peace and world security studies, a joint appointment at Amherst, Hampshire, Mount Holyoke, and Smith Colleges, and the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He serves as a senior visiting fellow at the Arms Control Association, where he studies the weaponization of emerging technologies. Michael is also the co-founder of the Committee for a Sane U.S.-China Policy and the author of a number of books, including Resource Wars, uh, Blood for Oil, and Rising Powers, Shrinking Planet. <laughs> Excuse me. So with that, let me uh, turn over the um, uh, uh, the mic uh, to, to, to Joseph Camarelli. Thank you, Joseph. Um, uh, Joseph, are you going to pose the question? Uh, yeah, that might help, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, friends. So the first question, uh, let me get the paper here. First question is, uh, that was really awkward. Uh, President Biden and other Western leaders often portray the global environment as an existential struggle between a rules-based abiding West and a nefarious alliance of authoritarian states composed of China and Russia. But many non-Western leaders, especially within the global South, perceive a more complex and multipolar world, incorporating many competing power centers. How would you describe this multipolar world? And what are its implications for U.S.-China and U.S.-Chinese relations for the U.S.-China and U.S.-Chinese relations? Well, thanks very much, Joseph. It's a great pleasure to be taking part in this very important uh, conversation uh, about uh, what amounts to the human future. Well, I think, we, uh, if I may, I want to paint uh, a broad picture and perhaps leave my more specific comments uh, when we come to the second question. Uh, I think it's generally understood, well, at least by those who have uh, made any effort to follow what's been happening, that the international system is undergoing a profound economic and geopolitical transition. Uh, we now have a multicentric world in which several major centers of wealth, military, diplomatic, and uh, organizational clout, some rising, others declining, are furiously competing to continue either their ascent or arrest their decline. So the important point I wish to make is it's not just multipolar. Some are on the way down and some are on the way up. The center of economic and geopolitical gravity, in my view, is shifting quite dramatically from the West to the East, from Occident to Orient. Now, central to this, of course, is Asia's renewed economic dynamism. Much of this has uh, until recently been associated with what we call the Chinese economic miracle. As uh, the World Bank told us of not so long ago, in the space of a few decades, China has achieved uh, the fastest sustained expansion by a major economy in human history. And it's still continuing. But important as it is, China's rise doesn't fully capture the profound changes now sweeping across the globe. Uh, because there is more to Asia's re-emergence than China. Of course, we've known about uh, Japanese reconstruction after the Second World War. Uh, but uh, beyond that, uh, we have seen um, uh, the rise of Southeast Asian economies. Indonesia is expected to be the fifth largest uh, uh, economy in the world within a space of 15 years or so. And by contrast, uh, Asia, uh, with Asia, contrast with Asia's phenomenal growth in GDP uh, is the contrasting performance of the US economy, which is just as striking. In 2000, which is not very long ago, the US accounted for 24% of the world's total GDP, gross domestic product. By 2010, 10 years later, it had shrunk to 20%. And by 2018, it was little over 15%. Uh, 
so the, the economic disparity in growth rates is just one of the signs. But the US decline, I argue, is just as evident in the military sphere. At face value, yes, US military capabilities radiate power. They far surpass uh, the technological capabilities uh, of any other major center of power. And we see that in technological sophistication, high levels of military spending, record military budget of well over 100 billion now and soon to reach uh, a trillion US dollars. But this muscle, which is real, uh, doesn't easily translate into military victory on the ground in the present landscape. And so we've had the costly war on terror, the disastrous war in Iraq, the protracted and punishing conflict in Afghanistan, the unholy mess in Libya and Syria. And what does the United States have to show for it? Not a great deal. All of that is as emblematic of the fragility of US power. And in Russia, the United States now faces a center of power and influence that's no longer willing or feels the need to comply with US interests and priorities. That's the significance of Putin's Russia. And uh, Russia will continue to busily modernize its military arsenal and make its presence felt around its periphery and in the Middle East. And of course, uh, China is now intent on exerting the political influence that it thinks believes is commensurate with its economic status. Uh, most strikingly reflected in the projection of military power in the South China Sea, in the breathtaking project uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative, uh, sometimes referred to as the New Silk Road. But having said all this, I believe there's another important dimension often overlooked, yet crucial. Crucial to the shape of things to come. Economic and geopolitical trends assume their full significance only when placed against a wider cultural and civilizational backdrop. We are moving inexorably towards a multi-civilizational world. The West-centric model in which first Europe and then the United States held sway is slowly but steadily giving way to a new world in which civilizational centers are emerging or re-emerging. Joseph, I'm sorry, one more minute. That's fine. Partly as a consequence of its global economic, political and military dominance, the West or the Occident came to believe in the universality of its culture and to measure progress in the light of its own achievements. But in the space of a few decades, the major Eastern civilizations that comprise the Orient, notably the Cynic, Indian, and Islamic cultural spheres have made a dramatic reappearance on the world stage. The civilizational impulse is known by no means uniform. In some places, it is buttressed by growing economic muscle, in others by the adroit use of soft power, and in others still by the politics of rage and despair. But there can be no doubt about the cumulative impact of this shift. Joseph, All the... I've, got to, I've got to call it here. I'm sorry to be the time. That's, a funny, that's it. Okay, well, you can go on in greater detail. We'll come around in, in, the, in, in the next panel, like next session in the Q&A session. Helena, to you. Hi, first of all, thank you so much for in, including me in this uh, lineup. I'm really looking forward to this uh, discussion. So um, I'm actually going to use some pictures that I have because I, I'm a bit of a visual learner in spite of the fact that I have currently visual problems. So I'm going to um, illustrate a lot of uh, perhaps what uh, Joseph Camilleri has done by um, showing some graphs and um, some texts and things quickly. So this is something that I found obviously from, I think it was Deutsche Welt or some um, German 
uh, site that showed in 2000 and 2020, which was the larger of the two trading partners, the USA in blue or China in red. So in 20, 2000, this was the situation. And in 2020, this was the situation. So that kind of gives you a little bit of a background. And then I'm going to move straight to something that I saw just this week from the social media of Javad Zarif, who is the former um, foreign minister of Iran. Iran is actually quite an important player in this whole shift that we're seeing now. We can discuss that more later. So he actually put up this uh, list of 12 theses, and you can find it if you go to any of his social media. Um, and I think they're really interesting. I don't agree with all of them, but I do think I want to draw attention now to number one, the transitional phase of international relations has been over for some time now. It's not that we're entering a transition, but it's, it's already, you know, we're well into it. Number two, the emerging global order is post-polar. And this is actually something I've been writing about. It's not unipolar, it's not bipolar, it's not angular at all, it's, um, it's post-polar. I, I kind of like that uh, formulation from him. Um, then number three, the three decade quest for a unipolar hegemonic order. And that of course is post the Cold War, US hegemony um, through for, forever wars, securitization and economic coercion has failed while exacting tremendous suffering, unforgivable human loss and huge waste of resources. Then number five, this is really important. War has lost its utility as a tool of foreign policy. Now we can obviously discuss this, but I think it's a really interesting um, starting point for a discussion. He says almost all initiators of wars in the 20th and 21st centuries have either lost the wars they started, even their existence, or at least have failed to achieve their stated objectives. And certainly if you look at the United States forever wars, that have been carried out in the in the current um, millennium, I mean, <laughs> none of them have been won in any sense. And then finally, number six, there cannot be any zero sum games in international relations. So anyway, I do urge you to go and look for these. I'm sure that Javad Zarif will be um, writing a lot more about this. In fact, that's what he says down at the bottom here. So then we come to, uh, okay, this is the Belt and Road Initiative that Joseph Camilleri talked about. I found this on the website of um, a Dutch organization, the Klingdale Institute. I, I rather like this, it's very schematic. Um, we've got the important um, BRI hubs, we've got the corridors, China's trade position per country, whether China is trade partner number one, trade partner number two, trade par partner number three. And I just want to draw attention to two or three features of this. One is that there is definitely a strong uniting both ends of the Eurasian landmass element to this. And that is being done both by rail and by sea. Another is the, the new emphasis on the Indian Ocean trading area, which prior to the emergence of Western imperialism, Western empire building 500, 600 years ago, this was a very vibrant um, trading area. And now we're seeing this re-emerging um, in, in the present era. And then the, the last one thing that I want to draw attention to is of course, that this is a, a global phenomenon that um, the Panama Canal and what's happening down uh, the, the Pacific coast of Latin America is also part of the um, Belt and Road Initiative. Joseph uh, Camilleri, I'm sorry that Australia does not appear on this, uh, on this schematic, but of course there's a lot going on there. So now I want to move from BRI to BRICS, which is the new um, grouping, not new, it actually started in the aftermath of the 2008 global financial crisis when Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South, later South Africa joined together in this thing that we call BRICS. And these are the five foreign ministers sitting together in Cape Town at the beginning of June. And interestingly, these 
people are foreign ministers of countries that probably want to, well, all of them want to join BRICS. Everybody in the Global South wants to join BRICS right now. These um, 10 of them, we see this Saudi foreign minister, we see the Iranian foreign minister, we see several foreign ministers, oh, that's the uh, Emirati foreign minister. They apologies, actually, apologies, Helena, one more minute. Okay, sure. They attended in person, and um, I actually found a, a news a, account that told us that uh, the ones who attended in person, Iran, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Cuba, Democratic Republic of Congo, Comoros, Gabon, and Kazakhstan all sent representatives to the, uh, to the BRICS foreign ministers meeting. Egypt, Argentina, Bangladesh, Guinea-Bissau, and Indonesia were participating virtually. So the, the reason I bring this up is that this August, BRICS will have its 15th summit meeting and it's likely that they will expand hugely, maybe including all of these candidate members, at which point, obviously, they have to find a new, a new acronym for themselves. They already have a, the new development bank. They've been doing a lot. And it's, I think it really behooves all of us in the global north or you know, in, in the Western sphere to understand BRICS a lot better than we do. I can come back to that more later. Thank you, Helena, for taking us this deeply into the Global South and the transitions. Um, Michael, the floor is yours. Uh, well, greetings, everybody. And thank you, uh, both Helena and Joseph, for getting us started on a very good note. Uh, so I will continue the discussion as best I can. And I think to understand the present moment, I think you have to go back to the end of the Cold War and the onset of the post-Cold War era. The US emerged from the end of the Cold War as the world's sole superpower, as it was called at the time, a hyperpower, wholly without significant rivals or challengers. It was, as uh, people said at the time, a unipolar moment. The USSR no longer existed, and Russia was a mere shadow of its predecessor, the Soviet Union. Its economy was shattered and its military was significantly weakened compared to that of the Soviet military. China at that time, we're talking about 1992, uh, was re remained a backward country. Uh, it had no modern industries to speak of and its military uh, was, uh, what was uh, even weaker than Russia's. So there were no major challenges to the United States. Uh, Europe was entirely in America's thrall. Uh, so no, no, re, no doubt was why, uh, the, why it was called a unipolar moment. But this did not satisfy the power brokers in Washington who sought to humble Russia rather than bringing it into the global economy and making it part of the modern world. Rather, uh, the U.S. sought to uh, keep Russia in a dependent, in a, in a dependent and downrated status eternally, uh, carrying on the Cold War, and sought to keep China from ever emerging as a great power. At the same time, the power brokers in Washington of that day sought to solidify U.S. control over the Middle East, the source of the oil that was crucial to world economic growth and wealth. So the U.S. embarked on what Paul Kennedy of Yale, the historian, who wrote the book, The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, called Imperial Overstretch, engaging in one Persian Gulf War after the other, intervening in faraway places like Afghanistan, committing hundreds of thousands of troops to uh, what, what, what came to be called the forever wars, uh, and a futile effort to stamp out resistance to US dominance. Meanwhile, America's potential rivals, Russia and China, used this time to build up their own strength. Russia recovered from its uh, post-Cold War, Cold War devastation, rebuilt its military, used its oil wealth to modernize the economy. And China went on a growth spurt, 
as we heard from Joseph and Helena and emerged as the world's second greatest economy, more importantly, develop its technology and its military. So uh, the unipolar moment drifted away and we had a new world situation. The US foreign policy establishment, the elites uh, that govern US foreign policy recognize this as this as a threat to US supremacy as early as 2011, with the uh, onset of President Obama's pivot to Asia. The elites recognized, even though the US was continuing to fight in Afghanistan and Iraq, that continuing down that path was a strategic disaster for the US, that with the rise of China, as Joseph has explained, America's dominant position would gradually diminish and erode. And they determined that it was essential that the US contest China, contain and curb its growth. And this was the essence of the pivot. Uh, and uh, they determined that it was necessary to build up American power in Asia. But as we know, a consequence of imperial overstretch reasserted itself with the rise of ISIS in Iraq and Syria, again demanding US attention in the Middle East. And so the pivot was delayed. It was not until 2018 that US elites, led in this case by Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis and then Secretary of State Mike Pompeo could begin extricating the US from the Middle East quagmire and reinstate the Obama pivot strategy. And now with President Biden, we have a wholehearted uh, resurrection of that strategy and giving it whole-throated support with a vengeance on steroids. Now American foreign policy is entirely dominated by the determination to curb China's growth and prevent it from ever rising as an equal to the United States. The US is using all levers of power at its command, diplomatic, technological, military, and otherwise to, it, to ensure the success of this strategy. And I uh, totally respect what Joseph has said, but the United States uh, nonetheless uh, has a significant power to deploy uh, to achieve these objectives, especially technological and military strength. So this is going to be an ongoing struggle, lasting possibly for decades. For the Michael, one more minute. Rest of our lifetime. Uh, however, the goal of restoring the unipolar moment, as we have heard from earlier, uh, our earlier guests is beyond America's reach. And instead, the US and its allies are going to have to negotiate with other rising powers to achieve its goals in this changing world. And increasingly, as we've heard, uh, the, its ability to control global decisions will fade and the US and its allies will have to compromise with and negotiate with these other rising centers of power, especially India. Uh, I, I, we heard about China's rise, but I think we have to keep our eyes focused on India. And the idea of it, India being given the lavish uh, the, the greeting it received in Washington last week, a former colonial power of- Thank, thank you, Michael, I hate to do it. <laughs> Fine. On we go. On we go. On so, we go. Oh, so on to then the second question, and we'll do it in the same order that we just had. Uh, many analysts believe that the war in Ukraine has hastened the emergence of a multipolar world. Why is this? Do you think the emergence of a multipolar or nonpolar world will influence the final outcome of the Ukraine war? And if so, how? I mean, a lot of questions here. And, and how are China and the U.S navigating these new realities as they seek to influence the world's the, the war's outcome. So the number of questions in there, so pick up which ones you want, and it's on to you, Joseph. Uh, thank you, Joseph. 
Um, well, the the war in Ukraine um, uh, is hastening the the if you like. Um, let me be, let me be contentious, contentious and direct. I think it's hastening the decline of the United States. Uh, it may do damage to Russia as well, uh, but I don't think it's going to be a very happy ending for the United States. Uh, now, to explain. What has the United States been doing in response to Russia's reassertion of its uh, place in the world and China's emergence as a rising power? It has tried to build uh, a coalition or rebuild or strengthen a coalition of allied powers. Now, I think the Ukraine war is stretching the NATO alliance to its limits. And within Europe, there is increasing disquiet about the direction of that policy, including the policies of the governments that appear to have most uh, uh, enthusiastically supported it. So I think you will find, with hindsight, later on, uh, that the Ukraine war will have weakened the NATO alliance uh, and created um, uh, frictions and tensions elsewhere in America's global network uh, of alliance systems. Uh, it may not be apparent because, uh, they and this is the other thing to remember, especially those uh, who are uh, residing in, in one part or another of the Western world. The picture that is painted by mainstream Western media bears little resemblance to the reality of what's happening in many parts of the world, the Ukraine war included. What the Western media have been doing, whether it is at direct, at the direct uh, uh, instruction uh, of the powers that be, or whether it is because uh, they prefer that point of view, is to paint a glowing picture of the virtue and power of all things that are American or Western, and to paint a, the bleakest possible picture of the vices of those who oppose the West and of their weakness. Now, that is not an accurate picture of what is happening at all. So I think that will, in that sense, the Ukraine war in ways that are unforeseen or were unforeseen will strengthen uh, what I have called the development of a multi-centric, uh, multi-civilizational world. Will this influence the final outcome of the Ukraine war? Yes, it will. Uh, because at some point or other, whether it is relatively soon or some way down the track, the war will have to come to an end. And the terms on which it will come to an end, whether we like it or not, will be set other than by the protagonists, uh, by those who are trying to uh, influence the outcome. And that includes, by and large, China and the global south. And that is why uh, the interlocutors in this conflict and how it might come to an end, the principal interlocutors at the moment are China, South Africa, and uh, a grouping of other African states, uh, Brazil, perhaps India at some point, and interestingly enough, a NATO ally, Turkey. And all of them in different ways are trying to bring about uh, an ending to the conflict, which will not be as the powers that be in Ukraine at the moment, or its principal back of the United States would wish it ideally to be. That's the reality. And at the end of the day, unfortunately, and this is the great tragedy of where we're at, uh, it, the, the, the biggest cost of all this will be borne by the people of Ukraine. It's one of the great tragedies of the period we're living through. Uh, how are China and US navigating these realities? One thing comes clear. China is projecting itself 
on the global stage, if not inside the United States, but on the global stage as the power that is thinking hard and working hard to find a peaceful solution to the conflict. And the United States is painting with great uh, effectiveness an image of itself as the power that wants to prolong the war at any cost, at any cost, no matter what the suffering might be uh, for the people of Ukraine. That is how it's increasingly perceived in many parts of the world. In that sense, I think the ideological, or if you like, psychological struggle as to the projection of image will be one that will be to China's advantage and certainly not to that of the United States. One more minute. I, f I finished, Joseph. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Joseph. That was very helpful and very impressive. Helena, you are on. That's great. I get an extra minute. Thank you, Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I won't take an extra minute. So, um, a couple of months ago, I wrote about, um, well, I've written several things about the effect of the Ukraine war, obviously, on the global balance. And I want to go back to something that the Franco British um, analyst, Emmanuel Todd, has written recently when he said that um, both Russia and the United States had nasty surprises at the beginning of the um, war in Ukraine. For Russia, the nasty surprise was a military one. They thought that they could um, you know, capture Kiev or, or impose their um, will on the Ukrainian people, and they proved unable to do that. And for the United States, the nasty surprise was that they, um, they, we, they, <laughs> um, imposed the, these crushing sanctions on Russia with the idea, as somebody said, to turn the ruble into rubble. And that didn't happen at all. In fact, the ruble had a very um, strong year last year and the Russian economy has suffered a little bit from the war, but no nothing like what the people here in the United States said it would. And Russia has built many new um, economic ties, especially with Asia, um, and looks able to, to sit out the war very, very successfully. So um, how did that happen? And I go back to um, the, the overuse over the last, um, well, 30 years, this period of, of US hegemony by Washington, and that is both Congress and the admi successive administrations of what the United Nations calls unilateral coercive measures, which we call sanctions, which people might call you know, attempts to impose siege on other countries. Um, I'm gonna share a something here that came um, it's not up to date but it's it's just a nice little graphic that shows you how many just the overuse of sanctions and this and this precedes the uh the war in ukraine we've got like in 2009 these were the sanctions and they don't even have the ones on Cuba. I think this is from the Center for Strategic and International Studies was my source. I can go back and find that. That was in 2009, there were that many sanctions. In 2019, there were that many sanctions. Like it's just a visual <laughs> of the overuse of, by the United States of sanctions, which I think the United States has kind of sanctioned itself into a box. I, in one of my analyses recently, I, I developed this theory of what I called team sanctioned, you know, which were all these countries around the world that had had devastating, tough US sanctions imposed on them. And they all started to develop workarounds, you know, like the Iranians and the Venezuelans and the Cubans, and they all figured out more or less how to, it, it, of course the sanctions imposed terrible economic uh, losses. But the, these governments all survived and they found ways to work around the sanctions. And then what happened in February 2022? The United States suddenly added Russia to team sanctioned. And Russia is a massive economy. 
So when they added Russia to team sanctions, I'm going to come back here and yeah. Um, okay. That, is that the same thing I was showing before? No, it's not. Sorry. Uh, let me let me start over. Um, okay. Maybe, maybe I could do without this, but I have a a picture. Okay, this one, and we'll give we'll give you just a minute for that. <laughs> Thank you. Is it working? Yes, yes, it is. Okay, super. So here is a map before. Oh, no, this map is after the addition of Russia to team sanctioned. And suddenly, all the members of this team, and I also talk about team tariffed, which, you know, given that uh, from the era of President Donald Trump and continuously until now, Washington has imposed tough tariffs on many sectors of the Chinese economy. And, you know, adding Russia to those two teams, team sanctioned and team tariffed, just strengthened them very, very much. And that helped um, Russia to obviously survive the economic sanctions imposed by Washington. And it acted as a huge spur to all these members of the BRICS and other countries of the global South to develop alternatives to the, to the ways that the United States historically has um, Im implemented the sanctions. I mean, sanctions are enforced in a number of different ways. One, through the use of the dollar. And as we all know, the, the role of the dollar in international trade has declined hugely, and I've written about that some. But also the United States controls a lot of, uh, enforces a lot of the sanctions through this thing called the SWIFT mechanism, which is a payment um, verification mechanism that if you, know, if you or I wanna send money to an entity in Europe or anywhere around the world, we have to use the SWIFT number and it all gets, um, you know, verified by this SWIFT mechanism, which is based in Belgium, but is totally controlled by the US Treasury. So now the, the countries in team sanctioned and team tariffed have developed all kinds of global workarounds, both to the use of the dollar. Um, we now have this thing called the Petro Yuan, which, you know, really wasn't a thing two or three years ago. And we have a number of different payment verification systems. In one of them, I know the Iranians played a huge role in, in developing this. So one more minute. great. Yeah, this is kind of the the um, the underpinning to what is happening with the emergence of the global south as a unified multipolar or you know even postpolar. It, it it's a much more distributed um, decision making system and it's one that is much more based on economics than on military and i just want to end up by noting that the population of the white countries of the west including australia and uh, new zealand adds up to around 12% a little less than 12% of the global total this is the same percentage as the percentage of white people in south africa before um, in the days of apartheid. And just as we thought that um, white uh, supremacy in South Africa was a bad thing, I think we should also, especially those of us who happen to be white, should recognize that white supremacy of the world order is also a bad thing. Thank you, Helena. It, it, your talk reminds me of just what I've been seeing in terms of de-dollarization as a process at work. Uh, Michael, you get the final word on this round before we go to Q&A. Yes, uh, so thank you. And um, I'm going to speak uh, extemporaneously here because while I agree with a lot of what Joseph and Helena have said, I think it'd be much more useful for our ongoing discussion if I point out where I disagree. So bear in mind that I agree with much, but I think there, there, are, there are places where I disagree. And those disagreements are important for our uh, common discussion. 
So uh, I agree that the war in Ukraine is accelerating the emergence of a multipolar world and has exposed limits to US power, as both of you have stated. But here's some disagreements. Uh, number one, I think the war has shown uh, that uh, war making is not necessarily proving to be useless in this new world, as Joseph has suggested. I think it's shown to be pretty useful to Vladimir Putin, um, or, or at least uh, it's, looking, it, it's looking like it might work out pretty well for him. Uh, Joseph and has mentioned the interlocutors who uh, might uh, might be involved in uh, resolving the conflict, uh, including Turkey, uh, India, uh, South Africa, and uh, and China, especially as Helena, I think, said also. Uh, all of those countries favor an outcome that is likely to leave Russia with more Ukrainian territory than it had before the war began. This is a shows that, that the use of military force was effective for Putin. And uh, I wonder what, what uh, restraints are going to be put in place in such an outcome to ensure that Putin is not going to say to himself, let's wait a while and then start the war again. I think we have to uh, have answers to that question. Uh, but but any any uh, outcome that that involves a ceasefire in place and assumption that that's where the new boundary of Ukraine and Russia is going to be is a military victory for Putin and shows that that military force works. Now I'm exaggerating this point so that we can stir up some discussion about it, but that's the way it looks to me. Uh, secondly, while the war has definitely exposed limits to American power, it's also been a harvest for the US. Uh, it has expanded NATO. It's vastly increased public support in Europe for, uh, for the expansion of NATO, for higher military spending in Europe, for Germany rearming, for Sweden and Finland joining NATO, for increased American presence in NATO. This is a vast harvest for the US as a consequence of the Ukraine war. But by far the greater victory for the US coming out of Ukraine, and I'm surprised that Joseph hasn't spoke about this, is that uh, many countries in Asia see that uh, Russia's uh, use of force uh, against Ukraine signal, might signal that China will behave in a similar fashion, especially towards Taiwan. And it's pushed countries like China, I'm sorry, countries like Japan and South Korea in a much more militaristic pro-US, anti-China, fashion and there's huge evidence, polling data, elections in Japan and South Korea to demonstrate this. Uh, the US China, the US Japan, US South Korea alliance is stronger than it's been in decades. And it's going to include increased US nuclear involvement in South Korea. Uh, this is huge victories for the US coming out of the Ukraine war. And even Australia, Europe, uh, uh, Joseph's own country, uh, the prime minister is all over himself talking about increased U.S. military ties to the U.S. Uh, Australia has signed on to a new treaty with the U.S. that's going to involve long-term military cooperation on nuclear submarines. Come on. Uh, this is not evidence of U.S. in decline or U.S. coming out of the war in a weaker position. Uh, we have to we have to look at at the pluses and minuses out of all of this. And in and in Asia, uh, the U.S. is reaping many rewards out of uh, you, uh, out of Russian aggression. Now, again, I'm pushing you. I'm I'm, I'm exaggerating my points uh, for the purpose of discussion. 
And I, I look forward to your answers to this and, and I guess we'll get them in the, in, in the Q&A if not otherwise. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Michael. My thought is to, before jumping into the Q&A, I wanna give Joseph a chance to respond. I mean, I think that's, the, the, the questions are live now and uh, let's see where it takes us. Joseph, the floor is yours. Yes, well, I think there's a lot of truth in what Michael has just been telling us, uh, but we need to put it in context. Uh, if the there is a very, very major push uh, by the United States and some of its allies uh, to build an anti-Chinese uh, coalition bent on the containment of Chinese power and influence. Uh, th 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 that's what they're working on and that they're working on it uh, uh, rather assiduously. There's no question of that. And it includes, of course, the current Australian government. Uh, but there is pushback from other parts of Asia, uh, which understand that their future lies as much with China as it does with continuing good relations with the West. And that includes most of Southeast Asia, with the Philippines as the major exception. And of course, uh, India is playing a very clever uh, double game. Uh, trying to extract as much as it can from the United States, while at the same time maintaining an even keel balanced relationship with China, despite its territorial dispute, and with Russia at the same time. So I think it's a very complex picture. And none of what's being done is going to intimidate China. Uh, it is not going to give up on its uh, uh, intention to see the reunification of uh, Taiwan as, as part of one China. Uh, it will not lead to a decrease in its presence in the South China Sea. None of these things will be achieved. So yes, there is much that is being done. Extraordinary resources are being poured into, not least by the likes of Australia, uh, into building up these military coalitions. Yes, that is definitely happen, happening. But whether uh, this uh, flexing of military muscle will yield the desired results, that remains to be seen. One final word. Uh, yes, what is happening in Ukraine is an unmitigated tragedy. Uh, there is no defending what's going on on uh, any side. Uh, war is not the solution to any of the problems uh, that is uh, that we are seeing emerge in the Ukraine-Russia-NATO relationship. Uh, and yes, a ceasefire uh, won't be the end of the story. That's why uh, the ceasefire must be accompanied by a serious negotiation, not just between Russia and Ukraine, but importantly, between Russia and the West. And that should be an integral part of any future peace plan. Uh, a ceasefire at best provides breathing space. It does not provide anything like the idea of a common European hope, uh, home, which was, of course, uh, Gorbachev's uh, uh, very uh, dramatic uh, vision for the future. And maybe it's time to come back to it. Thank you, Joseph. I think we'll come back to this in, in several different ways. Uh, I have to sort through about 26 questions and comments at the moment, <laughs> so please be patient with me. I'm going to start with the last one. Maybe this is for Helena initially, but for everyone else to jump in on it. With the increasing integration of China and Russia into the global capitalist system, should we expect these nations to become imperialist rivals to Western imperialist centers, as well as the likelihood of another world war? Oh goodness! I actually disagree with the uh, <laughs> with, with the premise there. I, you know, China has been very closely integrated with the world capitalist system, but is now um, on both sides of the Pacific. The United States and China are. The word is de-risking, and um, you can't completely separate them. Um, obviously, you know, if you're running a corporation like Apple, which has fabrication facilities throughout China and Southeast Asia, and, and you know, does the design in California and sells devices to both sides of the Pacific. And none of these big corporations can completely decouple, but um, 
there's a high degree of what they call de-risking, which means that actually China will be doing more of its uh, kind of supply chains throughout Southeast Asia and potentially throughout Central Asia. And the United States, honestly, our um, manufacturing base is extremely um, paltry and unsuccessful thus far. So I, I think economically, it's all going to be in Asia. And does that mean they will be imperialist in the same way that European powers were imperialist? I think not. I think the Chinese have taken real steps to rein in finance capital in their own system. And they are definitely investing both domestically and internationally in building up strong infrastructure. And this is really important. They're building up infrastructure which is low carbon emissions. And they have a plan which Bloomberg and many other ex experts say will bring them to zero carbon emissions by 2050. And I've got a, a, a Bloomberg uh, picture of that. Um, whereas, you know, our country and Western Europe have nothing like that in terms of a, neut a carbon neutral plan for the next it's 27 years till 2050 so i think that's that's going to be the future and um i don't think it's going to be there will be not imperialist um overtones but it's going to be a, a kind of as i mentioned earlier a much flatter and more distributed decision making structure by design because that's how they want to do the economic growth you know, by having centers of excellence in all those different countries of the BRICS and as it gets expanded. So it's going to be a different kind of a world, as Javad Zarif said, hopefully a post-polar world. I just also note that, you know, China has a different history and culture uh, of, of influence and empire. So I think we should bear that in mind. I wonder if Michael and Joseph would want to comment before I move on to the next question. You can move on. Okay, so a uh, question that, that both Michael and, and, and Joseph touched on, India will soon be the largest country in the world. How does, how does this figure in all of this? Well, I, I did start speaking about that uh, when, uh, when you cut me off at the end there, at my time ran out. So uh, I'll, I'll- Finish up, finish it up. Uh, I'll jump in with what I was gonna say. Um, I do think Modi's, Prime Minister Modi's visit to Washington was an astonishing event, uh, both in its lavishness and in the hypocrisy of uh, Mr. Mr. Democracy now Biden uh, welcoming uh, this authoritarian ruler who is stamping out minorities and dissidents like uh, like another all all the other authoritarians that Biden has condemned not a word said in public about any of this uh but nothing but praise for Modi but i i, I think that this was a realistic uh a realistic uh understanding a realistic assessment of the fact that India is going to be one of the power brokers of the future world order, one of the major power centers in a future multipolar world, and that the US it will have to uh, recognize India's rise to prominence and have to deal with it. And, and uh, the US, I think, un understands that it, 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 if it's going to contain China, it can't do that without India. And, uh, and and so all 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 stops out to uh, to embrace Modi. Uh, whether whether India will play along with this remains to be seen. I think India has uh, its own national interests, and, and as Joseph said, uh, it's not going to fall. I don't think it's going to fall into the Western camp just as it might have at one time, it's going to pursue its own interests. And at sometimes that means cooperating with China and sometimes cooperating with the West. 
uh, and and other times forging its own relations. I I think this is. I think that was a moment. People are going to look back and talk about that event as a turning point in history. I think. Could, could I just go, jump in there? I, I mean, it. I agree with what Michael just said. I would noted that you know all this lavish treatment of Prime Minister Modi here, and you know all the signing of agreements and the state dinner and this and that. When he talked about Ukraine, clearly he was under a lot of pressure from his hosts here in Washington, D.C. to come out and criticize Russia's invasion of Ukraine. He did not. You know, he is a loyal member of BRICS and BRICS as an organization has no official position on the, on the matter, on the question of Ukraine, which is significant. You know, I think they would have loved to have had Modi come out and, and criticize Russia, but he didn't. And I just note that this is the new way that these, these countries of the global south, the BRICS and the others, they hate to be put on the spot and forced to choose you're with us or against us. They want to make their own decisions and build their own networks of relationships. Joseph, you get the worst, last word on this. Just very quickly, uh, there's no question uh, that um, India is already, and more so as time goes on, uh, going to be uh, a major center of power and influence and a different kind of worldview uh, than the one that we associate with uh, a dominant West. That's true. Uh, but on the other hand, in terms of comparing with China, uh, there's more to it than just economic performance. And of course, India has a long way to go before it can quite match uh, China's performance. But apart from that, it doesn't have the steady, long-term uh, planning that is measured in terms of decades, not yet, and it may never do so. And uh, India has much more serious and debilitating minority issues, minority problems, than does China, notwithstanding Tibet uh, and uh, Xinjiang, uh, which has serious problems that uh, China, of course, has to handle. But if you think of the a divide Hindu, particularly as it's developed in recent times, Hindu Muslim, not to mention Hindu Sikh and even Hindu Christian and other uh, ethnic minorities within India, it's going to have its hands full. And the deep divide, of course, uh, which is glaring between the emerging rich and the still uh, wide ranging uh, poverty that afflicts a very large proportion of Indian society. So it has it was con going to continue to have major internal problems. And these will probably come to the fore more and more, especially in a post Modi era. So there's not going to be the kind of continuity, relative continuity that we've seen in China, but more of a zigzag uh, response emerging from India. So its capacity to impose itself on the international stage won't quite match China's, at least as far as we can see in the foreseeable future. Thank you. I mean, I think all of these, these uh, responses are pointing to just how dynamic, uh, you know, the current situation is and uh, how it's playing into a future that we can't fully envision. Uh, a question here from Michael Hoey. Uh, in June 1994, Russia became the first country to join NATO's partnership for peace. What went wrong? Did it have anything to do with the lack of desire to integrate Russia's arms industry uh, into the West uh, for the uh, flexibility of interoperabil interoperability? Is it related to Russia being the number two arms exporter? Um, so what went wrong and, and did, did arms production and sales have anything to do with it? Whoever would like to take it. I'd be happy to take it. I mean, I think, I think one, what went wrong was what happened in, in Yugoslavia, prim primarily, you know, the uh, NATO intervening to contain Serbia and, and to break up Yugoslavia, which, you know, during the Cold War was a, a vital area of neutrality, a part of the non-aligned movement, um, culminating in... Um, 
obviously the NATO bombing of, of Belgrade and um, the, the war for, for the secession of Kosovo at, at a time in which the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which is an important body that emerged from the Helsinki Accords of the 1970s, the OSCE had a monitoring mission in Kosovo that was reporting that things were getting a little better, but the United States and NATO were determined to pull that out. And you know, I, th I think all of that, those actions in East Europe were very, very troubling for, for Russia, obviously. And meantime, they were pushing NATO's borders ever further to, to the East, in spite of the verbal undertaking that Secretary of State James Baker had made to Gorbachev um, and Dubrinin back in 1989, 1990. So yeah, I mean, the partnership, it's, it's kind of like what happened with the G8. You know, there've been these attempts to integrate Russia into, first of all, the, the military alliance, the NATO, NATO partnership for peace, and then into the G7 plus one became the G8. And then when the G8 collapsed, that's when Russia actually took the initiative to found the BRICS organization. So um, yeah, there were a lot of missed opportunities during those first 15 years of the post-Cold War era. Michael, Joseph, you want to comment? No, yes, I please. think uh, Helena said it quite very well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good, good. So then a, a very different kind of question. Uh, in talking about China, you did not address the imprisonment of one million Uyghurs and the extreme human rights violation by the Chinese, of both the Uyghurs and people in Hong Kong. How do we how do we understand what's happening in terms of human rights in China, and how do we respond? Well, if I uh, perhaps uh, I can look at that. Well, the question is who the we is. Mm -hmm. hmm? If the we is mighty, virtuous me, then no go. Uh, we won't be doing anything of value for the Uyghurs. If you say who, what should the international community be doing about human rights violations? What is a proper international uh, community response uh, that is not selective, that looks at China's human rights uh, issues firmly, clearly? Then you have to do it elsewhere as well. Uh, you can't have uh, one approach for China, a different one, as we've already heard, for India, and another one yet for Saudi Arabia. It's got to be universal, otherwise it just falls by the wayside. And only the, an international uh, approach is viable, and it has to be a UN-led approach, not a US-led approach. So, if the US, for example, or Australia, or one any other country in the West is very keen to see an upgrading of concern, effective concern for human rights, uh, then it has to be done uh, by way of strengthening international institutions uh, that are not culturally blind or ideologically blind, uh, but open uh, to all of the uh, manifestations of human rights infringements everywhere in the world, including in one's own country. So if, for example, Australia, if I may give that example, was to make comments about uh, 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 the situation of the Uyghurs or Tibet, fine, but it must then allow China to make comments and indeed to make connections with uh, the totally dispossessed indigenous communities of Australia. I haven't heard an Australian government willing to do that. Michael, how are you? Yes, I, I will speak on, on behalf of the Committee for the Sane U.S. China Policy, if that's okay, with the sponsor of this event. And we have a policy to speak to this issue. We condemn the uh, imprisonment and, and abuse of the Uyghurs and other minorities in China, as we condemn the increase in violence against Asian Americans in the United States. We see both of these, uh, these, uh, these abuses and mistreatment as being exacerbated 
by the increase in governmental sponsored hostility between the two countries. Uh, it's been demonstrated uh, that increased US congressional hostility towards China, the more verbal attacks there are on China in Congress and elsewhere, uh, the, there's a, there is a, a, a dem demonstrable increase in violence against Asian Americans in the United States. Uh, these attacks are, are against Asian Americans generally because most white Americans cannot distinguish between Chinese Americans who are the intended targets of the violence supposedly and other A Asian Americans or people from Asia. Uh, and we believe that there's uh, the same could be shown in China that the Chinese government, the Xi Jinping government uses uh, increased American hostility towards China as an excuse for cracking down on dissent. For example, in Hong Kong, uh, saying that any internal divisions and dissent weakens China's solidarity in the face of American hostility and aggression. So it, we believe that by uh, tone, toning down US-China antagonisms and hostility and seeking cooperation between the US and China on a wide range of issues will make it possible to uh, address the human rights violations uh, in both countries. If I could just jump in and uh, first of all, Joseph, just to appreciate your, your, your response reminded me of something that one of my heroes uh, once said, uh, Bob Moses, one of the leaders of the, of, of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the Civil Rights Movement, uh, when asked what should be done or who, which, what should we do, his response was, who is we? Uh, and yeah. you know, in, in approaching these and other human rights questions, uh, to my mind, uh, I always think in terms of the need here to first address the reality that we have 2 million people in prison, uh, most of them people of color, which is no, no accident. Uh, let me then go to a question, if I can, yeah, uh, from uh, Alan uh, Bar Barlevy. Uh, is, the U is it the U.S. who is prolonging the war in Ukraine, or is it the Ukrainians who are not willing to compromise over their country and are willing to fight and die to maintain their perceived freedom? Uh, I, I, let me start in saying that's a ridiculous question because the Ukrainians didn't start the war and the Ukrainians are, are, are not the ones who are continuing the war. The people continuing the war are Russian invaders and occupiers. So it's ridiculous to ask this, this question. Uh, Joseph, Helena? Yes, well, uh, I think it's a, a, everyone has a hand in prolonging the war at the moment, and that's why the war is going on. Uh, the Russians are, the Ukrainians are, the Americans are, the Europeans, uh, European governments, some, some European governments are, uh, because that they are- That wasn't in the question, though. The question was between, was it the Ukrainians or the Americans? Yes, well, I'm saying, everybody let, is let, contributing. Let, let Joseph finish. Let, let yeah. Joseph finish. Well, I'm saying it's not either one or a, either A or B. It's all of those that I've mentioned are having a hand in the prolongation of the war. The initiation of hostilities, we know that was Russia. Uh, but what is it that's prolonging it? What is it that is inflicting more and more and more human misery, particularly on the people of Ukraine, to a lesser extent on the people in Russia? It's because so many different players at the moment have an interest in investing their strategy in, in a military direction, in giving their strategy a, a, a strong role for the use of force. So until and unless the protagonists in this terrible tragedy begin to realize uh, that a military solution is not going to be to the, to the advantage of any of the parties concerned, then we may be able to move towards some kind of uh, uh, peaceful resolution. But until and unless that happens, they are all having a hand in the prolongation of military hostilities to everyone's disadvantage. 
You, you just don't have come to in. Yeah, Helena, let's, let's, let's go, yeah. Helena, and, and keep it keep balanced here. Yeah, I, I, think, I think my answer would be a little different to that of my two colleagues, um, maybe complimentary. But I think, um, first of all, we should recognize that the Ukrainians are the people who have suffered most from the war and continue to suffer most from the war, but the peoples of the global South have been suffering terribly as well. And we shouldn't forget that. And that is why I think we've seen the calls for a ceasefire coming from, you know, all, all the members of the BRICS except for Russia. So we could call it, you know, the BICS. Like we've seen, you know, Brazil, we've seen, we've seen India to a certain extent, we've seen definitely China, we've seen South Africa, we've seen the African Union, we've seen the Pope all coming forward with um, a call for a ceasefire. And I think that's what we should get behind, a ceasefire, and then leaving all the other issues to be resolved later. Just as, for goodness sake, there could have been a ceasefire in the First World War in 1916, when everybody, like the, the British and French and Germans, all realized that they couldn't win the war. And they actually asked Woodrow Wilson to, to negotiate a ceasefire. He didn't for some reason. And then he threw American military into the war. And a lot of things happened as a result, including, you know, you had the, 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 the Soviet uh, revolution in, in um, Russia, which was because there was not a ceasefire in 1916. You had, because of, of the nature of, of the peace that was imposed on Germany, you had the rise of Hitler. So a lot of really horrible things could have been avoided if you'd had a ceasefire in Europe, in Verdun in 1916. I see the calls for a ceasefire in Ukraine very similarly. I think that's what we should put all our weight behind right now and leave all the other issues to be resolved later. And just as a point of, of really good historical um, comparison here, there has been a, a a ceasefire, an armistice in Korea since 1953. And it's not ideal, but it is so much better than the fighting that was going on between 1951 and 1953 in that, in that peninsula, in which millions of people were killed, including you know, by the most terrible forms of weaponry short of nuclear weapons. So you know, get the ceasefire, then sort out the issues. So uh, let me point out, Helena, that every member of the BRICS is keeping the war going. They're not helping to end the war. They're keeping the war going. India and China are the leading financial uh, sustainers of Russia's war by buying Russia's oil. They're the leading two consumers of Russian oil right now, the leading about, and therefore are the leading so providers you of currency. Not, not now to, I'm no, let, him, let, him, let him finish that. We'll come back and let you and yeah. Joseph. Uh, now I'm talking. They, uh, uh, India and China are, are the leading consumers of Russian oil and thus the main suppliers of the money that, because all that money goes directly to Putin the sales of oil goes to the state and it's what's being used to sustain the war. South Africa has reportedly sold weapons to Russia to keep the war and Brazil buys Russian oil and, and, and other products. So they are, they are complicit with the ongoing war. Uh, we can't say that they're, you know, they're just supply, they're, they're just, uh, proponents of uh, advocates of peace. Everybody has their hands dirty in this. Uh, uh, and uh, secondly, I, I reject the notion that a, that you could just call a ceasefire and that the armistice is that's that would if we had an armistice in place like you describe, that means that Russia won a military victory in Ukraine by seizing a fifth of Ukraine's territory. Are you, are you saying that you sanction Russia's use of military force to seize the fifth of Ukraine? So let's go, let's go with Helena and then Joseph. Well, I, I, just, I, I think Michael and I disagree deeply on this and, and it, I'm not sure how useful it is for us to continue discussing this here. 
because the main thing we're trying to talk about here is the emergence of a new kind of world order. And I think, honestly, Michael, your thinking is very like, you're with us or against us. Whereas I think all the people from the global south who were at, represented in the Cape Town meeting, for example, whether um, in person or virtually, they want to escape from that, you're with us or against us. They want to build, you know, to get back to building infrastructure and links and eco economics and not get into military polarity. Joseph? Uh, just very quickly, uh, I, I disagree a little bit with Helena and I, and I disagree with Michael as uh, perhaps even more so on, on two points. I don't think you can concentrate purely on ceasefire and say, and we don't know about the rest. I think you have to get the protagonists and in the, first of all, Ukraine, Russia, and then more generally, uh, Russia and uh, NATO. You have to get a commitment to sit down around the table uh, and there, there would be two different frameworks in order to discuss all legitimate grievances held by either side. Just a commitment to discuss, not with a particular outcome uh, as a precondition, but the precondition will be ceasefire plus negotiation discussion to follow, serious discussion. Uh, maybe with some uh, mediatory roles played by certain certain players. Uh, but I think that's a prerequisite because otherwise you have uh, a situation which is likely to explode again at any moment. So there are many issues and literally and really on the question of the Ukraine war, the primary interest of uh, uh, Russia is not the acquisition of new territory. That's not how I read it. Yes, as a second best, but I think its primary concern are certain red lines to do with what NATO is and uh, what the borders of the NATO alliance are, what it does, what it stands for, and uh, where it draws the line. And I think that's the big negotiation that the Russians would be interested in. And the question of territory uh, could be up for grabs. It could be some uh, version of autonomy within a larger Ukrainian state. It could be any number of possible outcomes once this larger question is being gen genuinely addressed. Thank you, Joseph. I'm gonna come back to the next question to you, uh, a qu question from Roger Smith. How do you foresee the new civilizational powers opening space for or inviting new and moralistic kind of multilateralism and or global governance uh, type setup? Uh, could the UN Security Council uh, be overthrown and something else replace it? Well, all these are no doubt possibilities, uh, but certainly the UN is in need of drastic reform uh, on many, many fronts. Uh, the UN is basically uh, a Western creation with uh, uh, some concessions along the way between its formation in the 40s and what we have today, but minor concessions. Uh, and the question is whether the UN can make itself open uh, to the idea of a multi-civilizational world. And that requires many, many things, uh, but it requires uh, a, a serious conversation about how the individual and collective interests can be reconciled. In other words, the individualism of the West will have to be tempered. At, at the universal level, uh, and uh, some allowance made for uh, collective interest. And side by side with that, so individual rights, but also collective rights, but also side by side with that, um, rights being very, uh, very closely uh, associated with responsibilities. So we need a new charter probably uh, of universal human rights and universal responsibilities so that we capture what is best uh, 
from both Western traditions and Eastern traditions. And that will have extraordinary political as well as economic uh, and even military implications were we to go down that road. But that's what await us, awaits us in a post-polar multicentric world, which is gradually emerging. And the question is whether we're up to the challenge, rise to the challenge of what all of the world's major reservoirs of wisdom, the major civilizations, uh, have to contribute uh, to that kind of possible outcome. So maybe here with the last question, I'm going to paraphrase the one that we have here, uh, which is, what, what is the primary U.S. goal uh, in the Ukraine war? Is it to support Ukrainian sovereignty and, uh, and its territory? Uh, or is it to weaken, weaken Russia? Well, I, I think I can hazard a first guess on that. And um, the first guess would be that um, there was the humiliating withdrawal from Afghanistan. Um, so one immediate goal would, would be to reassert that the US means something in military terms internationally. Um, I mean, I've seen that throughout <laughs> the, the decades that I've been following international affairs, for example, after the humiliating defeat in uh, Lebanon, they invaded Grenada. Or, you know, after the humiliating defeat in Vietnam, you know, or in the context of, of moving toward that, they bombed the hell out of Cambodia. So, you know, it, it's a thing, like you have to, it's called reasserting the um, credibility of our deterrence. So that is one thing that was happening. Another thing that was happening was clearly, you know, major investment by the military industrial complex in forming manufacturing consent for this war. And that's continuing. And if you look at the profits that are being made by the big five arms manufacturers in this country, you know, they're astronomical and it's wonderful for them. Actually, many sectors of the US economy have been doing very well, including the oil and natural gas sector because they kind of, they, they cut out um, the, the Russians ability to export natural gas to Europe. So in Europe, including Britain, you have very high gas prices and petroleum products in general, whereas here in the United States, th there's a bonanza for, for, remember that the United States is now a net exporter of, of hydrocarbons, which we weren't in earlier decades. So there's a lot of economic sectors in this country that have been, uh, been profiting, but I think the main thing at the beginning was to kind of reassert I, I think of it as a kind of a testosterone problem. You know, you have to reassert your masculinity. Um, but then there are all kinds of trends here in Washington, D.C., who want to see, you know, Putin overthrown, Putin weakened, Russia weakened. I mean, people get all kinds of ideas. I, I think that's one of the main reasons I think that a ceasefire is really important because the, the kind of the the evil spirits of war are all over this this city. I'd like, I'd like Michael and Joseph to be able to jump in on this as well, but only to say that after the events of this weekend, uh, we might also be seeing Putin uh, wanting to demonstrate uh, powerfully uh, that, that he and Russia are still in the game. Uh, Michael, do you want to go next and let Joseph uh, wrap us up? Yes, but Joseph, do you want to uh, if other people agree to extend the Q and A another ten minutes or so, I think we should wrap up. I'm just looking what we've got for questions and and where we are, Michael. Okay. Uh, so the U.S. government, the Biden administration, or certainly the the people who are voting the money that Helen has discussed, are very clear what U.S. goal is in Ukraine. It, 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 it is to further weaken China, not Russia, <laughs> but to weaken China because uh, Russia is seen as China's strongest military ally. But 
of the U.S. Our leaders are clear. China is the number one enemy. They say that China is our number one enemy and Russia a distant second because it's considered not a long-term threat to U.S. supremacy. China is the long-term threat to U.S. supremacy. And because Russia is a, a, a possible military ally of China, uh, it has to be weakened because that weakens China's uh, future uh, alliance system and its future military capacity. So the money being spent, the trillion dollar, near trillion dollar budget, all that money is not for weapons to defeat uh, Russia. The weapons are almost exclusively to defeat China in war. Uh, so so the, the, for the U.S. elites who shape U.S. policy, it's to, it's to defeat China. Thank you, Michael. That's very helpful. Joseph, you get the last word here. Well, very briefly, I think there are, uh, first of all, we're not talking about the United States as a society. We're talking about certain elites, political elites, military elites, and of course, corporate elites. And they don't always perfectly match. They, they come to a common uh, position uh, through negotiation and bargaining. So we need to distinguish between the, so there is one set of players, very powerful players, who, as has already been said, are doing roaring business out of the Ukraine war, absolutely roaring business, not just in relation to Ukraine, but the spillover effects in other parts of the world. So it's given a fantastic boom uh, to the arms trade. And that's undoubtedly one of the powerful um, factors at work uh, helping to shape U.S. policy. It's not the only one. The other thing, yes, it wants to bleed Russia dry. And as Michael is suggesting, to the extent that it is an ally, a strong partner of China, it might then also weaken China's position. Now, how anyone could really seriously entertain such a stupid idea is hard to believe, uh, but I'm sure there are enough stupid people in the in the key places to allow for that idea to surface, more or less exactly as Michael has suggested, because it's not going to weaken China one little bit, regardless of what happens in the Ukraine war. But, but I think one of the other, which hasn't been spoken, again, in my view, a foolish idea, the idea that the Ukraine war can in the not just immediately but also in the longer run cement the nato alliance as a thriving a strongly effective functioning military alliance uh, that can take decisive action and i think they see ukraine as a test case for that and i think they're likely to be very sadly disappointed thank you joseph um just in closing here, let me say that um, uh, this discussion was more dynamic than I had anticipated. Uh, I think it reflects that we're grappling uh, with a world which is in massive transition, uh, the outcomes of which are uncertain, uh, and trying to be able to begin to uh, look at uh, you know, the world that we need as opposed to the world that we have. Uh, one of the things that we didn't discuss in any detail, but which I think needs to be important for us, is beyond looking at the tensions and the competition for power and influence, is the need to find cooperation so that humanity can survive, uh, not only in terms of the dangers of, of uh, unintended nuclear war, uh, but also in terms of climate change and pandemics. So, so in the future, you know, I hope that even as we have our disagreements, uh, you know, I, I expect beyond the disagreements, I think the disagreements are helpful. Uh, I think they reflect the need to kind of work out our understandings and come to a deeper truth. And I, I, I really appreciate that we moved in that direction in, in this session. Uh, and I, I want to thank each of you for your really helpful contributions, uh, may, maybe anticipating those who were listening in. I think it was extremely rich and important conversation. Uh, and, and I'm really grateful for that. And I also, again, want to thank Mariana Fernandez for making this possible uh, with, with her technological abilities, which uh, far exceed my own. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and um, wishing everybody who's on with us 
uh, to um, do what you can uh, for justice and peace in the world. Thank you. Well, well said, well said. And thank you to you, Joseph. Yeah, thank pleasure. you for pulling it all thank together. You, Joseph. My pleasure. And thank you, everyone. So I'm going to uh, be sending the, the link to Joseph and he will share it with all of you. Enough. I would I would continue a conversation, but we have a pattern here of people holding on and, and, and making it difficult to have a conversation uh, among the five of us. So mm -hmm. I think we'll, we'll, we'll close here and we can pick up uh, individually or collectively by email.